Hey gang, it's Leela here from the Comic Connection with this week's comic book reviews. First up, we've got Amazing Spider-Man number 600 with main story written by Dan Slott with art by John Romita Jr. Uh, Aunt May's wedding is right around the corner, but someone's trying to make sure that it doesn't happen. Meanwhile, Doc Ock takes control of every mechanism in New York City, promising a utopian society to its residents, but boy does that go really wrong. So Spidey is on the run when the city is literally out to get him, and uh, he needs some help from the Avengers, who finally do show up. Uh, then he approaches the Fantastic Four for help, and Peter and Johnny track down Ock at his hideout, and the day is finally saved, and the wedding goes on without a hitch, and then something happens at the end. There's a big surprise on the last page. Uh, I really like this story. Dan Slott is a great Spidey writer, and John Romita Jr. is, you know, a great artist, so you can't go wrong with this one. Uh, what makes this book really great is that it's got six backup stories that are all new, and many of them are really good. I'll just talk about a couple of them. Um, there's a Stan Lee one called Identity Crisis, where Spidey visits a psychiatrist to discuss his issues. Uh, I, I really liked it. It was funny, and it sort of reviewed what it's like to be Spidey all, for, all through the years from beginning to end. Uh, if you're a Spidey enthusiast, you'll really like it. Uh, I also like the one uh, written by Mark Wade um, called My Brother's Son, and we catch a glimpse of uh, what Ben Parker thought it was like to be a father after Peter's father died and he had to take over the role. Uh, it's really heartfelt and it was good to see a story from Ben's point of view. Uh, definitely have to read it. And also uh, one at the end called Violent Visions. Um, get a new player appears to tamper, or shows up and tampers with the web of fate. And it looks like this is going to be sort of a lead-in to everything that's going to happen to Spider-Man in the future. So you definitely want to pick up this issue to get an idea of where Marvel's heading with the character. Next up, in another week of big 600s, we've got Incredible Hulk number 600. Uh, with the main story called Seeing Red by Jeff Loeb and art by Ed McGuinness. Uh, who is the Red Hulk? That's the big question. Uh, ben Urich details a story that he'll never print about how he witnessed that MODOK was using Bruce's gamma-rated cells to create a gamma-powered super soldier program. Um, they don't answer the whole who is Red Hulk thing, still. Um, and I only thought the story was okay, but I liked the way that it was done. I liked the Ben Yurick sitting down to sort of type the story at his typewriter and, and admitting that it would never see print. It's, uh, you know, reminiscent of the whole Daredevil thing, and I thought it was really cool. But overall, only okay. Um, then there's uh, two backup stories and a reprint. Uh, in the back of a Hulk of a Different Color by Stan Lee, Hulk and Rolk fight again, um, and then Galactus shows up, and it's kind of weird. Um, and then in uh, all-new Savage She-Hulk, Weapon of Armor by Fred Van Lint, uh, Lyra, the genetically engineered daughter of Bruce Banner, fights Banner, fights to keep the Earth safe. Uh, that one was a lot more interesting for me. I haven't been reading all-new Savage She-Hulk. Um, but she's a really cool character, and this was a pretty good story. So uh, definitely pick it up to read that. Uh, the reprint of Hulk Grade number one, I know, it's, it's okay. Uh, what I really did like that was that they didn't do in the Amazing Spider-Man book was that they did a cover gallery, which was really cool. Um, but overall, not as impressed by this one as the Amazing Spider-Man book, which was a lot better bang for your buck. But if you're a Hulk fan, I'm sure that you're still going to enjoy this one. And last but not least, we've got Lenore Volume 2 number one. Uh, written and drawn by Roman Dirge. In this one we get a glimpse of the rebirth of Lenore 100 years ago and learn about the man whose life was forever changed by the events that happened that day. Uh, Lenore is really kooky and cool. Uh, probably not for everybody, but I gotta say I really liked this book. I mean, the art's kind of out there and, and the story definitely is too. I agree with, uh, someone said that it's sort of like Tim Burton crossed with Dr. Zeus and it, it definitely is like that. Uh, so if you're looking for something kind of kooky, um, that's kind of neat, then definitely pick this one up, it was a good read. Hey folks, Jim here with this week's comic reviews. First up, Dresden Files, Volume 2, Number 1. Written by Jim Butcher, with art by Ardian Saif and Rick Ketchum. In this one, bodies are piling up and Harry's key witness is one of them. Can Harry prove his innocence and find the real, real killer? I really enjoyed this book. If you missed the Dresden Files on TV like I do, you're really going to like this. This is written by the actual author of the book, so you're going to enjoy it. Next up, Transformers, All Hail Megatron, number three. Written by Simon Furman and Mike Costa, with art by Don Figueroa and Chi Yang Ong. In this one, Ironhide and Optimus deal with the fallout of recent events, while the Decepticons probe into the mysteries of the Autobots, Autobot Matrix of Leadership. Uh, it's always nice to see Don back doing Transformers, but what the hell are they supposed to look like? Uh, this is all wrong. I really love Don's work, but this just looks wrong to me. Uh, especially with having them with human-like facial features. But if you're a Transformers fan, 
I guess you can pick it up. And last and certainly least is Death Clock vs. the Goon, written and drawn by Eric Powell and Brendan Small. And in this one, the Alliance of the Serpent plans to warp reality to their will, so they can, so they send Death Clock to an alternate reality where they soon meet the Goon and all hell breaks loose. Um, I love the Goon, I love Eric Powell's painted art, but putting it together with Death Clock Metalocalypse, it just doesn't work. It does not work at all. Um, it's not funny to me, it just... It's not a great book at all. I can't recommend it at all. If you're a fan of Metalocalypse, this is the only way you're going to get a comic for it. So maybe pick it up if you're a fan, but I don't recommend it otherwise. Hi everyone, it's Crystal with this week's comic book reviews. Up first we have Emily the Strange, the 13th hour, number one. Uh, so in this book, it's Emily's 13th birthday. She begins her day with the nightmare and then finds out there's a solar eclipse, after which she gets some presents, including a pocket watch from an aunt she didn't know she had which is then quickly stolen by a stripy imp, uh, who she then pursues with her favorite black cat, Sabbath. Um, I really enjoyed the art in this book, which is very quirky and fun. I think it's uh, appropriate for young viewers and um, is a really nice light read. Uh, it's my first time being exposed to Emily the Strange, and uh, I thought it was uh, cute and fun and a good read. The story is by Rob Rieger, and the art is by Buzz Parker. So up next... One definitely not appropriate for young readers, we have Herogasm number three from the pages of The Boys. Um, if you haven't read The Boys, um, it's a really good series if you're over 18. Uh, so the story here is by Garth Innes, and the art is by Macria and Burns. Um, so in this episode of Herogasm, The Boys launch their attack on Herogasm. Everything works except Huey runs into Black Noir with unfortunate results. Uh, not PG-13 results, so you'll have to read to find out. Um, however, they do kidnap their target, but the target wasn't who I expected it to be, so there's another surprise there. Um, if you aren't reading The Boys or Herogasm, and you're over 18, I really think you should, because it's really, really interesting, and it takes a whole different spin on what the world might be like if there actually were superheroes. Uh, so, Herogasm, good. And last but certainly not least is X-Force number 17. Uh, with art by Choi and Obek, and story by Kyle and Yost. Uh, this is the bloody cover. I would like to say that the X-Force series, which I've been reading from the beginning, is really awesome, and I very much prefer the bloody covers in almost every instance. Um, if you aren't reading the X-Force, I really think you should be. In this issue, um, 30 seconds after everyone returns back to their proper time stream, X-23 returns to this, the future time stream that they're now in, um, she jumps back in, but ends up getting captured. Um, the two mutants that have been um, triggered to explode are apparently being sent after the United Nations. Uh, so the X-Force team has to get there in time to defuse these two mutants who have been set to discharge their mutant powers in um, such a way that they'll kill lots of, lots of people, kind of like human bombs. Um, so they get there in time enough to defuse one of them, but the other one, we're not so sure. Uh, I'm really enjoying this story, I'm really enjoying the return of Archangel, which is very exciting, and also it's nice to see um, some X characters really just using their powers to kill and maim lots of people, and not being so much caught up in the whole, oh we're good, blah blah. Uh, so yes, X-Force, very good, pick it up. So see you guys next week!